join me as we delve into the captivating history of postal service in this vibrant city of Hong Kong, China. From ancient Chinese postal systems to the British era post boxes scattered throughout Hong Kong, we'll uncover the secrets and stories they hold. And all this through an epic post box sunrise to sunset challenge. Don't miss out on this incredible journey. Hit that subscribe button and join us as we explore the rich tapestry of Hong Kong's postal history. So get on that stagecoach, pour a cup of tea, settle yourself down because remember, Coasty always delivers. Okay, we're on. As we speed towards Central, let's take another question from the students. Okay, this one says, are all pillar boxes red or green, like in Hong Kong and Britain, or are there any other colours? Well, this is an interesting question. Let's delve deeper. Many of the UK's earliest boxes were painted green, particularly in the countryside to blend in with the landscape. Burgundy was also a regular colour, but were repainted the famous pillar box red by 1884 to increase visibility. In the 1930s, with the advent of air travel, special air mail pillar boxes were painted light blue. The British Overseas Territory of the Cayman Islands has blue post boxes, and in 2019, some boxes around England were painted blue in honour of hosting the Cricket World Cup. And following the island of Guernsey's Postal Service independence in 1969, from 1980 onwards they painted their post boxes Oxford Blue to represent the island's postal service colours. Here in Hong Kong, to mark the handover of sovereignty, they painted their post boxes green, with only a few ornamental red ones remained dotted around the territory. In the Republic of Ireland, following their independence, the post boxes were also coloured green. Post boxes were traditionally sent around to all of the British overseas territories, so they were prevalent in places like Singapore, Malacca, Gibraltar, Sri Lanka, Malta, New Zealand and more. Here's a white one from the old British concession in Shanghai. Between 1843 and World War II, there was a British and international concession in Shanghai and other coastal ports along the Chinese coast, where British post boxes were used. Portugal also had British boxes so some made it to Portuguese Macau. They were also sent to places where the British ran their national post service so we have some down in Argentina, this yellow one in Uruguay from 1879. When Cyprus gained independence they painted their post boxes yellow. Now the other colour which is seen across the United Kingdom is a gold post box. Following the London 2012 London Olympics, if you won a gold medal, a post box in your hometown was painted gold. Check out this gold medalist, Bradley Wiggins' gold box in his hometown of Chorley, and tennis player Andy Murray's in Dunblane. If you are aware of any other colours of post boxes, drop it in the comment section below. Now, we have made it to Central, and there are no in-service pre-World War II colonial post boxes here in Central, but what there are, are two or three gems of historical significance. So let's head into the city and take a look at them. And our first stop in Central is uh, this building here, the uh, Hong Kong General Post Office. There have been uh, four general post offices here in Hong Kong. This is the current one built in 1976. There have been some grand ones over the years, we'll find out about them a little later. All right, let's head downstairs to the Postal Museum where there is one, if not two, boxes of interest. So if you want to come to the Postal Museum, it is in the General Post Office here. We've got lots of memorabilia from across the years. We have this wonderful mural on the wall of Hong Kong Harbour and it looks great from afar but when you look closer you can actually see what each of the tiles is made of. So actually they are stamps from across the years from what looks like all over the world. So not just Hong Kong stamps, there's a lot of Australian stamps. In fact they look like they are all Australian stamps. 
So if you know anything about the history of this stamp mural here, put it in the comments below, but it's a wonderful mural as you enter the Hong Kong Museum. And this is what we've come for. Not in service now, but we have two wonderful post boxes. Let's start with this one here. This is a, a Queen Elizabeth lamp box. Could well be the only lamp box here in Hong Kong left. Um, beautiful old traditional red color. And then right next to it, we have a red Queen Victoria uh, post box, pillar box. Uh, one of only two, maybe three. The other one is in the Hong Kong Museum, which is currently being renovated, so we can't see it. So this is the only one we can see today. So let's have a little closer look. Uh, see the words post office around the top. Nice concave top, so the rain falls off easily. And there we go. The Queen Victoria Cipher, VR. Mm, beautiful post box made in Derby and London, it says. Now, do you know how to tell if it's an old one or a new box? A post box A or a type B? Let's find out. Apparently, if you hug it and you can put your arms all around it, it's a type B, it's a smaller one. But if it's a type A, your arms won't be able to get around it. So let's see if I can get my arms around it. Actually, I can. I can get my arms fully around it. So this must be a later one, type B, so late on in Queen Victoria's reign. There we go, A's or B's. Start hugging the pillar boxes. We made it to Statue Square now, right in the heart of Central. Got um, HSBC building here behind me. We've got the Supreme Court, the Cenotaphs just there. And we've also got a very special oval post box that thousands of people walk past every day that don't realize there's a bit of history behind it. And it's this one here, right outside, uh, right on Chater Road, named after Sir Paul Chater, very prominent businessman here in Hong Kong back in the late 19th century. And it's very special for a reason. Can you figure it out just by looking at it? Hmm. Let's find out why this is so special. This post box only carries the Scottish crown instead of the Queen Elizabeth II royal cipher and it has something to do with the pillar box war which refers to a number of politically motivated acts of vandalism across post boxes in Scotland during the early 1950s in a dispute over the correct title of the then new British monarch Elizabeth II. Ascending to the throne in February 1952 following the death of her father George VI the former Princess Elizabeth adopted the royal style of Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom. This was reflected in the Queen's royal cipher, which took the Latin form E2R. Some objected to the usage as the new Queen was in fact only the first Elizabeth to reign over the United Kingdom, or indeed Great Britain. This was because Queen Elizabeth I was only Queen of England and Ireland, not Scotland. Campaigners wrote letters to officials challenging the accuracy of the Queen's title in Scotland, but their efforts were unsuccessful. On November 28, 1952, an official ceremony took place at Edinburgh's Inch Estate to introduce the newly designed pillar box, but it soon became a source of controversy within the community. Within two days, the box adorned with the E2R symbol was defaced with tar. The following week, a parcel containing explosive material was discovered inside followed by another in January. The situation escalated on the night of February 12, 1953 when the pillar box was destroyed by a gelignite bomb with the explosion heard over a mile away. Fortunately there were no injuries and no mail was present in the debris. A new box was subsequently installed at the same location devoid of any royal markings. During the dispute over the insignia, several post boxes throughout Scotland were targeted. The conflict known as the Pillar Box War even reached the courts, but attempts to challenge the Queen's right to claim her titles proved unsuccessful. However, a resolution was reached in 1953 stipulating that Scottish pillar boxes, mail vans and related items would bear the Crown of Scotland to prevent further disorder. The Scottish crown we see today was first used at the second marriage of James V of Scotland in 1538. 
and has either been worn or present during the coronations of several other Scottish monarchs, including Mary Queen of Scots, James I and VI of Scotland, Charles I and Charles II. Next time you're in Hong Kong, get down to Chater Road in central Hong Kong to have a look at Hong Kong's only Scottish Crown post box. I think it's time for another postcard. So this one is of the third generation uh, general post office, which I'll tell you more about in a second. And this one is going in the Scottish uh, Crown oval post box here. And it's going to a man in Colorado who may have some Scottish blood in him. He's definitely got Austrian blood in him. Uh, and this is for all the Scottish people that you hired uh, for your place of work and thank you for hiring me back in the day and for the friendship and the things that you've taught me along the way. So this is going all the way to Colorado. And let's head back to the ferry pier because we have to get across to the island of Lama now to Sokyu Wan and we've got about 17 minutes to make the ferry and I'm dying for a coffee at my favourite coffee shop. So let's go. All right, catch you later, boys. See you later. And there we go, that's Uncle Russ Coffee here at the Ferry Piers. Uh, big shout out to them. They serve the community here in Central, but also on Lantau and other places around Hong Kong. Great coffee. Now, I need to take this time to say huge thanks. I'm humbled because last night we hit a thousand subscribers on Coasty Explores. So thank you everyone out there who's watching the videos. Here's to all of you. And let's keep promoting the channel. And uh, now we've got to head off to Lama for an interesting post box and a bit of a tale from the southern part. So let's go. Okay, we're just about to get on the ferry and this one is from a student at my school and it says, when did Hong Kong's postal system begin? Great question. This is a long one. Let's find out all about Hong Kong's postal system. Hong Kong was a British Crown colony from 1842 but was occupied since 1841. However, the earliest recorded mail from Hong Kong was from British merchant ships moored out in the harbour between 1835 and 1839. Six months after the British planted the flag down at what we now know as Possession Point or Die Dart Day, Mr Johnson, the second superintendent for trade, wrote to the Governor General of India to state that he was setting up a postal station here in Hong Kong. It was in 1841, close to the grounds of St John's Cathedral in Central, which was built later in 1846, when the first recorded post office was built. He instructed that all mail sent for the Chinese expedition be labelled to the Hong Kong postmaster from now on so that the letters weren't offloaded in nearby Macau. The first person in charge of the post office here in Hong Kong was a man called Robert Edwards in April 1842. He had a salary of $50 per month with an extra $50 for clerks, stationery and candles. He worked closely with the harbour master who would ensure the mail reached the territory safely. In those very early days, there wasn't actually a charge for letters and parcels. In September 1843, the first office postmaster, a Mr. Spring, was appointed. And on New Year's Day 1846, the small post office was relocated to a grand new building located near Pedder's Wharf on the corner of Queen's Road and Pedder Street. It was the second general post office building. In the late 19th century, the post office was in an urgent need for expansion and in June 1911, the third generation post office was built in the English Renaissance style with commanding views over the harbour. This grand old building was replaced by the one we see today in 1976. Ferry is so important to the people of Hong Kong and we can see it's a 
some coconuts being delivered here, probably to the local restaurant here. Uh, without these ferries, these people wouldn't have the, the goods to sell to the tourists and the locals all around it. Oh, we made it to Sokuan, which is a small fishing village on the southern tip of Lama Island. And this is, a, if you want to get out of the city for the day when you're visiting Hong Kong, get yourself to this island. It's uh, got some wonderful seafood restaurants, some lovely hiking trails, and in the other village to the north, there's some great pubs as well to get a beer at the end of the day. So let's have a little walk around Lama Island. Not today, but we will one day do a review of that public toilet. It's a good one. Okay, right, as we head down, We've got lots of restaurants here and most of them have got fish in the tank and you can choose your fish. Some of these you can also fish yourself, buy the fish somewhere else and bring it and they'll cook it for you at a price. And some of these, or one in particular, the Rainbow restaurant has even got uh, a ferry back to Central. So if you do eat at that restaurant, they offer you a free ride back, uh, which is about half an hour. Uh, back to your hotel in Central. And I've just spotted it. I was going to turn the camera off, but there's no point because we are right here in the middle of the restaurant and stuck behind here is our third pre-World War II postbox of the day and it is a George V. Uh, there we go, GR, and it's even got the V in. Some of the George V don't have the V in, they've only got the GR. But this is George V, so between 1910 and 1936. And it's pride of place here on the main strip of the restaurant. So if you do come here, do get some seafood and check out that George V post box. We're gonna keep going down now because we've got a few minutes to spare. So we're gonna find out a few more historical facts about Soku One. let's go. Common around these parts are these mud flats, which attract mud skippers and crabs and other shellfish. And also something that is ubiquitous here in Hong Kong are these temples called Tin Hao temples that are located close to the sea. Let's find out more. So Tin Hao, also known as Matsu, was said to be a, a native in Fujian province called Lam Mak Lung during the Song Dynasty about a thousand years ago. And according to legend, she has gifted power and saved many people from sea disasters. The seafarers therefore worship Tin Hao and regard her as their patron saint. Now I know we've got a lot of World War II fans out there, especially at the school where I work. So just for you, I'm gonna take a little trip around the other side of the mud flats to find out a little bit about a cave used by the Japanese in World War II. Let's go. Just made it just around the corner from uh, Sokuwa and we've got here the Kamikaze Grottos from World War II. So in World War II the Japanese were stationed here in Hong Kong Towards the end of the war, they dug caves into the side here on Lama and hid their torpedo boats that they would take out into the open ocean and try and hit British and American allied ships out there. Never actually came to fruition and never actually got it finished. And uh, here's, a, here's a good picture of the Japanese troops stationed here um, surrendering to the British in 1945. Okay, time to say goodbye to the island of Alama. We'll be back for a full tour one day. And we're gonna go on this little chugger here across to Aberdeen, named after Lord Aberdeen. And then we're gonna take a bus and go around to the old town of Stanley. Okay, time for another question. This is, oh, it's a good one. How and how long did the post take to get to the UK from Hong Kong in the old days? Hmm. I know it's long, so let's find out. With 
the distance of over 10,000 kilometers between Great Britain and Hong Kong, this mail service was never going to be quick. However, on September the 1st, 1846, the first regular monthly scheduled mail service began aboard the paddle steamer Lady Mary Wood. The mail would first make its way from Southampton to Alexandria in Egypt, before crossing the desert by donkey and carriage, before then being loaded onto the Lady Mary Wood at Suez. It would then exit the Red Sea, drop off people and mail in Sri Lanka, before making it to Singapore, all in 41 days. It probably took 10 days to two weeks to then make it onto Hong Kong. By 1853, this service had doubled to a twice monthly service and in 1869, when the Suez Canal opened, this time would have reduced even more. The completion of the Kowloon Canton Railway in 1911 provided an alternative route for mail going into the mainland. Starting from 1912, all mail between Great Britain and the Far East travelled by the Trans-Siberian Railway, unless marked for sea mail. Initially, this would have been via paddle steamer to Shanghai and switching to the railway there. This transcontinental rail link brought it down from what was 30 days via Suez by sea down to an average of 21 days. When airplanes began delivering mail between France and Indochina in Saigon, the British trialled this by sending a steamer to Saigon, then a plane to Marseille, and then on to England by land. This took 13 days, although a plane was later added on to the Hong Kong to Saigon leg, bringing it down to nine days. A weekly airmail service to Singapore started in 1935, which connected it to even more airlines. We are in Aberdeen, on the south side of Hong Kong Island. We've now got to take a double-decker bus around the southern coastal road of Hong Kong Island, where we're going to end up in Stanley, where there is the oldest post office in Hong Kong that's still in use, with a couple of post boxes to have a look at, so let's go.